So we are going to learn the Laplace transform method of solving differential equations and use it on the example y prime plus y equals 4e to the 3t. And of course, this is a fairly simple example, but all the results that we learn here will generalize to much harder differential equations. Things that are second order and third order with cosines and sines and whatever on the right side, there are a lot of things that you can solve with Laplace transforms. Now, when I originally learned Laplace transforms, they were very confusing to me because all of the ideas of taking an integral and multiplying by e to the negative st and why does this work so well didn't really make sense to me. I was really confused. So if you were confused when you learned Laplace transforms, you want to know why they work, or if you're going to learn them in the future, I would recommend going through this whole video. We're going to do a complete derivation of how Laplace transforms work because I think that's the best way to have a really intuitive understanding of what's going on, and that'll really help you when you use Laplace transforms. So let's start with the idea of what we're doing. We have this y prime plus y on the left side of the equation here. Really the reason that differential equations are hard in the first place is that we don't just have a y, but we also have a y prime. If we had an equation like, for example, 2y equals 4e to the 3t, well, this would be really easy to solve for y, because we can just divide by 2. But in this case, we don't have 2y, we have a y prime, and that's a lot more difficult to deal with. If there were some way that we could turn y prime into some form of y, that would make it a lot easier to solve this equation. So let's think about what function can we apply to a derivative that gets us back to the original function. Well, of course, there is one function that does that, and it's called the integral. So we might think to take the integral of y prime. With respect to t, of course, there's a problem when we do this, which is if we take the integral of y prime, we also have to take the integral of y. And it seems like that hasn't helped us very much, because then we end up with y from y prime, but then we also have the integral of y dt over here. And of course, now we haven't gotten any closer to solving for y because this integral is just as hard to deal with as this derivative. Notice the problem here is that we want to integrate y prime more times than we want to integrate y. Because if we integrate y prime twice instead of once, well then we would have the integral of y dt plus the integral of y dt. And just like before, we could add those together and that would make it a lot easier to deal with. What we really want to do is be able to integrate y prime more times than we integrate y. So is there any way that we can do that? And the question we're really asking is, is there a formula for integrals that leaves us with some integral coming out the other side? And there is an answer to this. It looks like this. The integral of u dv equals uv minus the integral of v du. This is the formula for integration by parts. Notice what has happened here to dv. When we see dv at the start of the equation, it gets turned into a v, but it's still inside this integral. So if we have dv being y prime, we're left with the integral of y at the end, which is what we want, because then we can write everything in terms of the integral of y. So maybe we want to apply integration by parts. Notice we also have a u inside of this integral here, but we don't have any u next to our y prime to do anything with. We really want some kind of u where when we turn it into du, it doesn't change the form of this integral. Maybe it's just a constant multiple of the original integral because we can always bring constants to the outside. So is there any function whose derivative is a constant multiple of itself? And of course, there is an answer to that. And it is all functions of the form e to the st for some number s. If we do this, differentiate e to the st, we just get s e to the st. We can bring the s to the outside of the integral, and that's very nice for us. I'm also going to make this a negative st, and the reason is notice we have a minus for this integral. So if we do minus a minus st, then it's a plus, so that's all nice for us. Let's see what happens when we use this method that we just created on this first integral, y prime e to the negative st. Well, we want to integrate by parts. So let's think about what we'll differentiate and what we'll integrate. We, of course, want to integrate y prime, and if we do that, we'll get y. Then we have to differentiate e to the negative st, and when we do that, we get minus s e to the negative st. 
So we have a plus minus over here for di, and then we're going to do these two parts. The first part will be y times e to the negative st, and then we'll have minus a minus becomes plus the integral of, we have this s first, but remember that's a constant, we can bring it to the outside. We get s times the integral of y e to the negative st dt. So this is looking like progress. We have the integral of y e to the negative st, and of course that's the same as what we'll get when we use this y here. But we have a problem, which is notice this y sitting on the outside of the integral. This is going to mess with us, because our whole goal was to write everything in terms of this integral. But now we have something else sitting on the outside. If this y were just a number, like 2 or 3, then that would be a lot easier to deal with, because we'd still be able to solve for this integral without knowing what y is. And here's the question. Is there a way that we can take y, which is a function, and turn it into a number. Say we have some function of t, f of t, and we want to turn this function into a number. Is there a way we can do that? And there is, if we evaluate it at a specific value. If we have a function f of t, but then we want to look at f of 2, well, f of 2 is just going to be a number. If you think about an example, for example, sine of t. Sine of t is a function, but if we evaluate it, at a particular place, like sine pi over 2, that just equals 1, and 1 is a number. So what we really want to do is evaluate y at a particular value. And what can we do to evaluate y at a particular value? Well, maybe we need to think about how we do this integral, because right now our integral is an indefinite integral. It doesn't have any bounds, which means we're not evaluating it. But what if we added some bounds? Maybe we have the integral from a to b. Well then when we do integration by parts, this element on the outside, y e to the negative st, is going to get evaluated at a and b. And what happens when we evaluate y at a and b? It turns into a number. And so we've solved our problem. So we really want a definite integral. Let's take a look at what bounds we should use. What should we pick for a and b? Well notice for y e to the negative st, as t gets really, really big, e to the negative st is going to get really, really small. It's a decaying function. It's going to get small really fast. So as t approaches infinity, this whole thing is going to go to 0. And we like 0 because we don't have to worry very much about it. If we add 0, we can just ignore it. So let's say we choose our upper bound to be infinity, so that way we never have to worry about it. It just goes to 0. Now we want to think about our lower bound. Is there some other lower bound that's just a nice number that's easy to deal with? Well, we notice there's e to the negative st. If we let t equal 0, we would just get e to the 0, and that's 1. Again, 1 is a very nice number to deal with. So let's take our lower bound to be 0, just because it's a nice number for us. So we have our integral from 0 to infinity of y e to the negative st. Notice what happens over here for this left part. When we evaluate it at infinity, e to the negative infinity is just 0. So we don't have to worry about that. And then the other part becomes minus, because it's the lower bound. And then y evaluated at 0 is just y of 0, which is a number. Then we have e to the 0, which is 1, so we don't have to worry about that. Then plus s times the integral of, from 0 to infinity of y e to the negative st dt. So this is the whole process for doing this integral from 0 to infinity on y prime. And because we don't want to keep saying the integral from 0 to infinity of this times e to the negative st takes too long, we're going to call this the Laplace transform. We'll call this the Laplace transform, and we'll use this nice fancy L because we're cool, of y prime. The Laplace transform of y prime is equal to this whole thing that we have on the bottom here. So we did the Laplace transform of y prime. We also need to do it for y. It, well, if we do the Laplace transform for y, that's the integral from 0 to infinity of y times e to the negative st dt, which is what we have down here, but ours is multiplied by s. So maybe we change this s just to an s plus 1. And lastly, we want to do the Laplace transform of 4e to the 3t on the other side of the equation. Well, remember that the Laplace transform is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of 
this inside, 4 is a constant, so we bring it out of the integral. And then we have e to the 3t times e to the negative st dt. Remember, that's the way that we defined what a Laplace transform is. Now, if we want to do this integral, notice we have e to the 3t and then e to the negative st. We can bring those two exponents together and add them up. And I'm also going to factor out. We have 3t minus st. We can factor out a t. So we'll have a 3 minus s, which I'll write as negative s minus 3. Now, negative s minus 3 is just a number. So this is just e to some number times t. Of course, we can take the integral of that. So if we do take the integral, the result we'll get is negative 4 over s minus 3 times e to the negative s minus 3 t. Then we evaluate this at infinity and 0. Remember, e to the negative infinity will just give us 0. We can ignore that. And then for the lower bound, minus a minus becomes a plus 4 over s minus 3. And then e to the 0 is going to give us 1. So we don't have to worry about that part. Our answer is 4 over s minus 3. So that is the Laplace transform of 4 e to the 3 t. So we can go back to this equation we have here and write the Laplace transform of the right side as 4 over s minus 3. Now, notice what we've done here. We have only one thing that's in terms of y, the integral of y e to the negative st. Everything else is a number. y of 0 is a number. s is a number. So this is just an algebra problem. All we have to do is solve for this integral, and then we can go backwards to the original function. So I'm going to skip the part where we solve for this integral and just write down the answer that we get here, and we can go from there. So I've cleared the board a little bit, and I've solved for the integral from 0 to infinity of y e to the negative st dt equal to this expression. Our goal is to get back to the original function y. Well, we haven't picked a number for s to equal yet, so maybe we should figure out what that is now. What value should we pick for s in order to make this process easy? Well, let's think about what we would have if we chose a number. Say, for example, we chose s is equal to 2, just some random number y e to the negative 2t dt. And let's say this whole thing on the right evaluated to 5. What does this equation tell us about y? Well, this integral from 0 to infinity is talking about an area, an area under a curve. So if we think about a curve going from 0 to infinity whose area is 5, well, one way we could do that is with a curve that looks like this. It goes up and then comes down, down towards 0. Another curve that we could write is one that looks like this. This would have the same area of 5. Another curve we could have is one that looks like this, that oscillates up and down, and that would have an area of 5. Notice we have a problem, which is if all we have is one statement about how this area equals 5, there's no one function that has that property. There's an infinite number of functions that have that property. So really, that's not what we want. We can't just have s being equal to some number because we don't have enough information about y that way to figure out what it is. But what if we leave s in terms of a variable? Well, what that's saying is that this expression has to be true for every single value of s. We have an infinite number of these area statements that has to be true. And that gives us a whole lot more information about y. In fact, if we leave s as just being a variable, there is only one function that has this expression on the right as its Laplace transform. So that means because Laplace transforms are unique, that we can get back to the original y if we leave s as a variable. So let's try to figure out what the original function y is, just leaving s like it is. We'll start out by looking at this 1 over s minus 3, because it looks pretty familiar. Remember when we did the Laplace transform of 4 e to the 3 t? The answer we got was 4 over s minus 3, which is the same as 4 times 1 over s minus 3. So it seems like the Laplace transform of e to the 3 t would be 1 over s minus 3, and that's true. What that means is if this integral has 1 over s minus 3 as part of its result, then the original function y must have had e to the 3t 
as part of the original answer. So we've solved for one part of this solution. The other part is this divided by s plus 1. Remember that y of 0 minus 1, that's just a number. But 1 over s plus 1, what could that be? Well, it looks very similar to 1 over s minus 3. But instead of having a minus 3, it's a plus 1. Well, we could also think about s plus 1 as s minus negative 1. And in this case, notice the Laplace transform of e to the 3t gives us 1 over s minus 3. If we have 1 over s minus negative 1, well, that must have come from e to the negative 1 times t. And all we have to do with the constant in the front is multiply it, y of 0 minus 1 times e to the negative t. This is the solution y that we're looking for. This is the answer to our differential equation. We could call y of 0 minus 1 a, or we could just leave it in this form, but this is the answer we're looking for. So let's go through a quick recap of how we use Laplace transforms to solve for this answer. First of all, we thought about the idea of integration by parts and how it lets us turn y prime into a y, but keep it in the integral because we're still integrating that y. We have the e to the negative st to let us do that integration by parts, so we have something to differentiate, and then we can bring this constant out to the front. Once we do all of that, we can write the entire equation in terms of the integral of y e to the negative st. It just becomes an algebra problem. Then we solve for this, which we call the Laplace transform of y, and then because we leave s as a variable instead of a particular number, the equation that we're left with gives us an infinite number of constraints for the way this integral has to operate. There's only one unique Laplace transform in terms of s for any function y. And by looking at the right side of the equation, we can figure out which functions would give us that Laplace transform, and that will get our answer. Now finally, I'm going to talk about how we solve some more complicated equations using Laplace transforms. First of all, let's think about what happens if we have higher order derivatives. Maybe we have a y double prime on the left here, and we want to deal with that as well. Well, if we had a y double prime, we would actually be able to apply the same process that we did here. We would just start out with two derivatives instead of one, and that means we would have to integrate another time. So we would be left with, well, this derivative, if we differentiate with respect to t again, would be s squared e to the negative st, and then the integral of y prime is y, and we would have this whole setup to plug in. Again, we would be able to write everything just in terms of y e to the negative st like we want. Now, one more thing we might want to consider is we got pretty lucky with the right side of the equation having a 1 over s minus 3, just like we had a 4 over s minus 3 from doing that Laplace transform earlier. But what happens if our equation is a little more difficult and we don't just have something easy like 1 over s minus 3 on the right side of the equation? The answer to that is that we usually have a table of Laplace transforms, because remember that Laplace transforms are basically just integrals. So we can find the Laplace transforms of common functions like sine and cosine and t to some power and all of those things, and we can write those down in a table. So instead of doing the integral every single time we find it in a differential equation, we just look up the answer and write it down. The other advantage of that is that when we see a differential equation and we get it down to this form on the right side, we can look at these values that we see and look at our table and see, oh, that 1 over s minus 3 must have come from e to the 3t. Or another example, if we have the Laplace transform being equal to 1 over s squared plus 1, that must have come from sine of t. So there are a lot of those common values that we can use to figure out what the right side of the equation is coming from, and then we get our values back. There are also a lot of other cool identities for Laplace transforms that come from the fact that it's in terms of an integral. So if we see things like the integral of a function we know how to deal with, or two functions multiplied together, there are a lot of ways we can get back to the original y. But the key with Laplace transforms is this integral that lets us do integration by parts, and this variable s inside this exponential that lets us solve just like this.